in conversation with Mary Kendo. Mary Kendo is Fox, a reader of her books across the genres and second, a writer of fiction. She brings a background and extra related feed to her writing along with some Celtic storytelling genes. Fueled by black coffee and a possible sprinkling of fairy dust, she tends to find inspiration in old places and sometimes why nailed in breed dough. She has published novels to explain to her fortune, historical mystery, and canvas boy coming of age, historical fiction. A third novel, Bottled Secret of Rosewood, is a contemporary gothic thriller to be released in summer 2024. She also asked three short stories published in dark fiction anthologies for charity. And on today's episode of Auto Interview, it's my utmost pleasure and joy to have on the show today, Mary Kendo. How are you doing, Mary? I'm doing well today. How are you, Peter? I'm doing very fine as well. It's lovely to have you on the show today. I'm quite excited. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, Mary, you know, the Splinter's fortune follows through the story of two women. That's in the name of Margaret and Blanche, you know, as they unravel family mysteries, deceit, and many more. And I'd like to ask you, I'm curious to ask, what inspired you to write The Spinter's Fortune? How does this book come about? Sure. So The Spinster's Fortune is actually based on real life events. Wow. And the way I came upon it is that I was doing research into family history. And I was reading through some historical newspaper articles. And I came upon this event that had occurred in the city of Washington, D.C., in the mm. neighborhood of Georgetown, there was an abandoned house and it was falling down and in ruins and people started looting it in the night and coming out oh. with treasure and monies. And oh. once the authorities were alerted to it, they mm. discovered that it was owned by an elderly lady who had been thrown in the poorhouse. So mm. I wanted to know why, how did this happen? I needed to answer the question of why. So I went ahead and fictionalized the real life event and made it into what we have here, the spinster's fortune. But in addition to that, it was researching my grandfather who passed away before I was born, so I never knew him. It was in researching my grandfather's history that I discovered the story because he was actually the lawyer on the case in real life. Wow. So I like to say, that not only did my grandfather inspire the story, but he also led me to it. Wow. Wow. That sounds quite amazing to me, really. I love the sound of the book, and I love to get to know about what inspired it, the, the beginning. So that's quite lovely to know, really. So thank you for sharing, really. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you have another title in the name of Canvas Boy, for readers who haven't read it yet and without giving much information away, could we have a sneak of what would expect in terms of teams picking up Campbell's Boy? And if you have a copy there, I'd love you to show it to the camera. Yes, certainly. So here is Campbell's Boy. I don't know if you Beautiful can see cover. It. Yeah. And Campbell's Boy is also the result of me doing research into family history. Wow. And in this circumstance, I uncovered one of those tales about an ancestor that maybe I really didn't want to know. Mm. And it um, involved a court case around a young boy named Emmett Campbell. Mm. And that is what I used for the title of the novel. Emmett is Campbell's boy. That's where the title came from. Wow. So in examining Emmett's life, it, I used the real life events of what happened to him. And then I had to use imagination to fill in the rest, which resulted in the novel. And so I follow Emmett through a young age to adulthood. And in that way, the theme, the overarching theme, it's a coming of age tale mm -hmm. of what Emmett goes through. Emmett has a hard, hard life and he has to overcome many obstacles. And so as we go through the story, we find out, what that might mean for a human to have such a hard life, but yet still 
mix in the good things about life with the bad things. What did he do with his life? And that's what I hope by the end of the story, the reader ends up with. So that's also a theme, the dark and the light of life. Oh, wow. This is quite amazing, really. I love the sound of your book. It sounds quite captivating to me. Sounds like something I love to pick up afterward. So thank you so much for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I hear you have a TED novel being published this summer. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? What inspired you to write that as well? So I'm very excited about my third novel coming up. It's being released in July. Here is a, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. A Batu Secret of Rosewood. Yes. Batu Secret of Rosewood. Right. Bottled Secrets of Rosewood is the title. It's a contemporary gothic thriller. Wow. And it was released by Artemisia Publishing in July, this coming July. Mm. So unlike the first two novels that I have published, mm. this novel was um, the result of not real life events, but a real wow. life find. I had read an article about a um, some highway work being done down in Tidewater, Virginia, near Williamsburg, Virginia. Mm. And they found a blue bottle in their investigations that it was intact when they lifted it out from the ground. Mm. And when they lifted it out, they saw items in the bottom of the bottle. Mm. So when they sent it off to be analyzed and investigated, they discovered that it was a witch bottle, which was a folk tradition brought over from East Anglia by the settler, early settlers in the U.S., Mm. And so right away, my mind started spinning and I took off with that. So that wow. the story revolves around this historical artifact. Uh, and I also use, I kept the setting of Tidewater, Virginia for the, mm. for the novel. And I do want to say, Peter, I do want to add one thing. When I started writing this novel, when I started drafting it, yeah. it was just at the beginning of over here, our pandemic lockdown times. Wow. And those, those were very strange times indeed, as I'm sure they were yeah. for you and everyone. And so it's it's resulted in a weird story. I'm not wow. going to lie. It's a weird story. Wow. Now that it's almost to the point of publication, it's it's occurred to me that the strangeness of those times I was living is probably also going to be felt in the novel when the reader comes to it. We'll see. I'll I'll let the readers decide on that. Wow. Wow. Well, I love the sound of this, really. I love the sound of your book. (laughs) Yeah, I love the sound of that. The sounds quite captivating to me. And I love you. If you have a copy of the Spin Tax Fortune there, I love to show it to the camera. I just saw the audience could see what it looks like. Beautiful yes. cover. And this has a good number of reception on Amazon. That's very great. Yeah, so nice commendation. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank that you. That's my first book, baby. Interesting. And now, Mary, I've always been fascinated about how authors, especially novelists like yourself, craft long sentences and bring us together in a way that it eventually makes a great novel. You know, this always leaves me thinking about how exactly you got your ideas and inspiration. And as far as writing is concerned, I would love to ask you too, how do you get your inspiration and ideas? Where do they come from? Well, Peter, as a fellow novelist, I'm, I'm sure you might agree. I think all writers are really students of human nature. Mm. We go oh. about our daily lives just doing normal day-to-day things. I think we are actually really looking at people and events and situations in maybe a different way. So I'll give you an example of an inspiration. Recently, I took a hike, and at the end of the hike in the parking lot, I saw that somebody had found a baby's shoe, and they had placed it on top of the post in the parking lot for whoever lost it, hopefully, to find it. And the first thing that came to mind is the writer Ernest Hemingway's famous four-word story, Baby Shoes Never Worn. Oh! But then, beyond that, here I had this inspiration. 
It was an expensive Nike toddler shoe. And where could wow. I go with that in my mind? That that's that's an example of how to get inspired because mm. I really think that stories are everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I love the sound of that. It's a real thing. The stories are everywhere. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Thank you so much for adding that, really. Yes. And you know, we can all get inspiration from anything, everywhere. That's amazing, really, Mary. I, I Thank you. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now I'm curious to know if you experienced any challenges in the process of writing your book. If there is any, could you share with us what challenge it is and how you ultimately overcame it? Also, I'd love to ask you, how do you undo criticism as a writer, especially the negative ones? With writing, of course, the first challenge is actually the writing itself, sitting mm. down and coming up with the story and all the pieces yeah. that go into making that happen. Yeah. And a big challenge is of course becoming better at the craft of writing. And that Absolutely. involves that involves educating yourself continuously. Yeah. Out and for articles to read or people to talk to or conferences, whatever it is that's gonna yeah. help you improve yeah. your and I think that's got to be an ongoing challenge. That challenge mm -hmm. never ends. You want to become better with everything you write, every book, every short story, whatever it is you're writing. Now, mm -hmm. other side is the business of writing. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> when I first published my book, it's been almost three years now, oh. I was I knew nothing about the business end of writing. Mm -hmm. So I I had to really, it was a steep learning curve to, wow. to become somewhat familiar and somewhat comfortable with that part of writing. Mm -hmm. Now, it involves experimentation. It involves things that work, things that don't work. It involves coming on podcasts with wonderful people such as yourself. Mm -hmm. But it, it's mainly getting out there and trying new things and, and coming out of your comfort zone to really get a handle on it. So I wouldn't say that I've overcome the challenge. I would say, like with the craft of writing, the business of writing is an ongoing challenge. Wow. But that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I'm in for, in for the long haul and down for the challenge. Mm. So moving on to the next part of your question about a criticism yeah. and negative reviews. There are a lot of writers I know that do not want to read the reviews they get they just can't go there and they feel that it will really uh not be good for them to do that i'm actually not that way i mm. actually really like to receive criticism and i like to read the negative reviews and mm. here's why i think that it has the potential to teach me something absolutely wow. in, in something that somebody offers along those lines Maybe there can be something false to it, but maybe there can be something true to it. And mm. I can pick up on that kernel, whatever it is, and I can learn from it and mm. I can add it to my toolbox to become uh. better what I'm trying to achieve. That's that's really it. Um, I think when it comes to challenges and criticism, that's my well. take on it. Well, I love your take on this, really. And I love how you react to criticism. And also, it's fun to get to know the challenges and content in the process of writing your book. We all yeah. know that, you know, writing itself is a hard thing to do. Everybody knows writing is not an easy oh, task. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And We're again, you know, absolutely, sure. absolutely. And again, getting the works outside after it's been written, it's something else. And that's, I think, likes the, you know, the typical work because, you know, People will never get to know you except to push yourself out there, except, you know, mention it to people. That's how they get to know that, you know, a book exactly. exists in this format. Yeah, so yeah. that's quite and lovely to know, really. The other thing about that is if writing and the business of writing and all these things stops being fun and stops mm. being enjoyable, mm. then I wouldn't do it anymore. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not myself unless it's really something – that's my passion and that I want to be doing. Yeah. That's another aspect of all of it. Well, 
<laughs> That's amazing, really. I love the sound of it. And I love to ask you, have there been any surprises that you didn't anticipate about being published? Also, do you think being a writer is a gift or a curse? Mm. So the surprise that I didn't anticipate, when I first got my first uh, contract to be published with my Spencer's Fortune, yeah. it was over three years ago now. And what I didn't anticipate is that it would open up other creative avenues True. that I didn't even know I had available to me. Mm. And by that, I mean, with things such as social media and promotion and marketing, mm. you can go deep and start to create your own graphic art and start to create other things along those lines. Yeah. And it opened up the doors of a creative path. Mm. that I hadn't even explored and didn't even know I could do. Mm. And I love it. Wow. Along with that, other opportunities along the way opened up, such as book covers. I discovered that I actually really enjoy creating book covers. I created this. Wow, interesting. Uh, and it's beautiful. When I was out in the real place of where this occurred, Calusa, yeah. California, there is a land formation called the Sutter Buttes. And I oh. took a photograph of it, and then I used all the crazy tools we have uh, for graphic arts and did that backdrop. Wow. So that's really something that was untapped in me. And it's been such a surprise. I, I never would have guessed. Uh, another, another avenue is book trailers. I've done three book trailers now, and they've yeah. been fun, and they've pushed me, and I love it. I love doing it. So that's a bit, that's been a big surprise. Now for the other question, do I think being a writer is a gift or a curse? I'm going to answer it's both. And here's why. Okay. I view it as a gift because I feel that every human being has a vein of creativity running yeah. through. Unfortunately and sadly, a lot of people are never able to discover that and to use that vein of creativity in their yeah, lives. Yeah. I feel so grateful that for me, I've been able to use writing as my medium, as yeah. how I can use my vein of creativity. And so that's a, that's a huge gift. Now, the curse is, because I know I have it, I need to use it. If I don't use it, I become angsty and, and nervous. I need to be able to process the world in mm. that way. So overall, I would say I'm grateful for both the gift and the wow. curse that I think writing is. Wow. That would be my answer. Wow. This is so thoughtful of you to say. <laughs> this is so thoughtful of you to say. You got me thinking deeply, really. I love the sound of it. That's great. I'm glad. That's wow. a good podcast interview when we do that, right? Interesting. I love the sound of it. I'd love to go back to this later. And watch. Yeah. I love the sound of it. Thank you so much for sharing, Mary. Yes, of course. Yeah. And I'd love to ask you, is there anything that you'd love to share with the viewers about your books that we did not mention in this interview and you'd love the viewers to know? Something, something I didn't realize. Uh, after my first book was published, yeah. what I realized is that when you're finished with your book and it's published and it leaves the nest and goes out into the world, Yeah, it's not your experience anymore. Mm. It goes out and readers find it or somebody finds it and they mm. pick it up and they have their own individual experience with it. And it has nothing to do with you, the writer. It's really out of your hands at that point. And yeah. the experience they have with it is going to be an experience that they're bringing and they're bringing with them their individualism and all the aspects of their life mm. to their experience. And then beyond that, if a reader shares with me that they've connected with the words that I wrote or that mm. the story touched them in a certain way, yeah. I, there, there's nothing better than that. That That's, that's the prize right there. Uh, and because to add on to that, I would have to say I would never – want anyone to feel that they're forced to mm. read something I wrote mm. because here's why 
because I don't want to be forced into reading something that I don't want to read. Mm. So that's how I feel about it. Wow. And all of that is something that I do want to share with your listeners because I think it's important to point out. That's amazing. That's so amazing, Mary. I love your answers to this question. I really love your answer to it. And I'd like to ask you, what sort of advice do you have for other writers who are still struggling with publishing a book? What would you advise people in this category? Publishing, of course, can be a very long, long journey. And I know that because I went through it. Mm. Here's my advice, because here's what I did for myself. Research, research, research. Research. If you keep researching out the opportunities and the the possibilities that are out there, mm. I truly believe that eventually one will crop up your way mm. because that's exactly how it happened for me. Yeah. That's exactly how I was able to connect with the the publisher that published my first novel, and since that time. I've just been able to keep going on down the path. Wow. And then along with that is the advice that we could we could say to anyone across the board about anything, yeah. which is never, ever, ever give up. Don't give, give up. up. Wow. Thank you so much for your advice. And I'm hopeful that viewers, including myself, would love to utilize it. Now, Mary, in case we have some viewers who are currently watching this interview and would love to get a copy of your book, on what platform is it available on for purchase? Well, so my third novel is already up for pre-order, I'm happy to say. Interesting. And that is available um, for pre-order on at all the places that books are sold, anywhere that you go to buy your books. But they're actually offering a discount on a place that I like, bookshop.org which is a great site because they give uh, money back to independent bookstores. Wow. So that's really neat. And I like that. Now, my other books can be found on my website, marykendallauthor.com. Mm. And I have all the books listed out and, and where you can purchase them. Interesting. Yeah. And I left a link in the discussion part of this interview where interested viewers can get a copy of Mary's books directly on Amazon and also on other platforms. So thank you so much, Mary, for accepting the invitation to be featured on P English Literature. It's awesome having this conversation with you. Thank you, Peter. I really enjoyed it. And again, <laughs> I really appreciate what you're doing for, for all the authors and myself. It was great chatting with you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that as well.